it's not just another race or racetrack. It's the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, my first year was, uh, you know, I was concerned with just making the race and, and being all in all of the great Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And then as it moved along, it took me 10 years before I ever finished the race. And the first race I finished, the 200 laps, 500 miles, I won. It's been nine years since Johnny Rutherford last won, but he still answers the call each May. Some drivers are here because of their heritage trying to follow in the footsteps of their successful fathers. Others come back each year trying to win the race that their father never could. All have dreams and hopes. And today is their last chance to put themselves in the chosen 33 that will compete in the greatest race in the world. And the field is filled for this year's running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. 33 are set to go. However, qualifying isn't over yet. Let's review the lineup as it stands right now. The front row consists of Rick Mears, Allenser Sr., and Emerson Fittipaldi. Rick Mears with new qualifying records in excess of 223. The second row, Jim Crawford on the inside, Mario Andretti in the middle, and on the outside in a Buick-powered car, Scott Brayton. Going to row number three, it's Bobby Rahal on the inside. Al Unser Jr. starts alongside Bobby Rahal, and then Raul Boisel. In the fourth row will be four-time winner, A.J. Foyt, flanked by Randy Lewis, and on the outside will be John Andretti. Row number five consists of the Porsche driver, Teo Bobby, Gary Bettenhausen in the middle, and Dutchman Ari Leipzig on the outside. In the sixth row will be Terrell Palmroth in his second race, rookie Scott Pruitt. And on the outside of row number six will be Ludwig Heimrath, Jr. Going to row number seven, it's Didier Taze, Bernard Jourdain, and Michael Andretti, who starts outside of row number seven because he was a second-day qualifier. In row number eight, it's Tom Sneva, a former winner, Gordon Johncock, a former winner, and on the outside of row number eight will be Derek Daly driving car number 10. Then in the ninth row for this year's 500-mile race, John Jones, Danny Sullivan, and Kevin Kogan. In the 10th row, it's Rocky Moran, Dominic Dobson, and Phil Kruger. And in the 11th row, Billy Vukovic III, Davy Jones, and Johnny Rutherford. Davy Jones was bumped from the lineup earlier, but he's bumped his way back into the starting field. Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Jenkins, along with Chrissy Konamaki on the fourth and final day of qualifying here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. In less than two hours, we will know the official lineup. Now, Chris, what do you expect here in the last few hours? A lot of action? I would think so. They're finding out now that they can get the speed they thought they couldn't earlier. So everybody's lined up ready to go. Johnny Rutherford finally made it in. I noticed in the beginning it said he was here 10 years before he finished the race. He was just wanting to get in, and that's the condition this year. He just wants to get in, and really it looks doubtful if the qualifying goes as we think it will. Well, let's look at the qualifying procedure used here at Indianapolis. There are four line the laps that are time three attempts for each car and the day four qualifiers line up behind those that qualify on the first second and third day but now when you get into the bumping procedure it's different. Regardless of when the car qualified, Chris, if he's the slowest, he's out of the race. That's right. The Indianapolis 500 starts the 33 fastest cars by speed by day. Years ago, pole day had two cars on the, the front row, quite slow, and it almost was that the pole winner was bumped. That could happen. It has never happened, but it's possible the way this is set up. And I look for the qualifying procedure, frankly, to be changed either next year or the year after. At the moment, the man on the bubble for this year's 500-mile race is Phil Kruger. He's hoping that his speed will stand up. He is standing by in the pit area with our Larry Newber. 
Well, Bob, actually sitting by, if you will, and uh, Phil has been uh, enduring the pressure with uh, a sandwich and some uh, orange juice and sitting up here on the scoring stand with wife Cindy. Phil, this is a bit of a reversal for you. Usually in years past, you had to work very hard to get up to speed and, and then just barely sneak in. This year, fast quickly, but then it slowed down. Yeah, it slowed down, and then it got fast, and it slowed down. The uh, U.S. Engineering and Dynamic Tool Penske uh, never had a problem getting up to speed, as you know. We had a problem with uh, one of the engine systems in all three attempts, and uh, just put us at a very low speed of 212. Phil, we were talking earlier that it's very, very minute, the problems that you run into, yet it has a major effect on the engine. It's so frustrating because you know what the problem is, but you just can't find that little key. Well, that's it, and of course, uh, you know, we're only talking about a few tenths of a second here. And, uh, you know, you get three attempts in each car, and um, each time we thought we knew the problem because we'd go back and recreate the qualifying scenario and not have a problem. We'd go put it in line and, and uh, qualify it and have the problem. So, we, yeah, it's very frustrating. It's a real, a real letdown. Well, Phil seems to become one of the major stories of the month every year here. And standing by with another one of the major stories for the third year in a row is Gary Lee. Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon. We documented yesterday the practice crash of Jim Crawford in the Lola Buick that he had qualified for the inside second row starting spot. Now, yesterday we said that the Lola had been returned to the Lola shop in England. And now you have a big smile because you have some good news for us. Well, yes, it looks like, uh, well, they say they can repair it. So... The schedule now is the car will arrive back in Chicago sometime uh, Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening. They're going to truck it down as fast as possible. The uh, the King Motorsports team are going to stay up all night, and hopefully it'll be ready for carburation at 11 o'clock Thursday. So once the tub is returned, it's a matter of reassembling that and hanging all the parts on it. All the parts are ready back in your shop right now. Yeah, all the parts have been race prepared already, so it's just an assembly job. We don't have to we don't have to do any bit by bit work. It's all a lump at a time, so it'll obviously be tight, but hopefully by 11 o'clock it'll be all together. You found the suspension problem that broke, put you in the fence, a grinding crash, but physically Jim Crawford is okay. Oh, I'm fine, yeah, no problem there. So obviously Jim wants to start inside the second row and not take the backup car to start 33rd, Bob. All right, thank you very much, Gary. Well, the track is open for practice right now. No one choosing to qualify. No one is in line. However, there are several cars at the north end of the track ready to move into that qualifying line in the next two hours. We'll be back in just a moment. It's bubble day at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the fourth and final day, and the final two hours. At the moment, we are uh, under a green situation, but no one is choosing to qualify. Back in 1988, just last year, there were three cars that were bumped from the starting lineup. In 87, there were three. In 86, there were three. In 85, there were seven. And back in 1984, only one car that was bumped from the starting lineup. On the track right now, several cars working on their race day setups. That is Derek Daly in car number 10. He has already qualified for the 500-mile race, but is just working on the race trim that will hopefully be successful on race day. You know, some drivers have reputations for being doctors of chassis and know exactly what to do. Other drivers go out and tell their chief mechanic, well, it's doing this and doing that, and leave it up to the chief mechanic as to what to do to correct those particular problems. Some of the great diagnosticians are Mario Andretti and Rick Mears. They come in and they say, turn this ball a half a turn to the left, turn that one three turns to the right, lift the wing or lower this and lower that. And they get the car exactly the way they want it. And that's what's going on right now, dialing the car in. Earlier today, not only did we have some uh, qualifying, but we also had a couple of incidents. This was Michael Greenfield during a practice session before qualifying began at noon. He came off of corner number one and lost it and began began spinning down into turn number two. Watch the car on the outside. That is Didier Taze, who becomes an innocent victim just getting pinned between the car and the turn two wall. You know, there's an old indie saying that if a car's in trouble in front of you, you should aim right for it. But when you get there, it won't be there. And had Taze done that, he would have gone underneath Greenfield, but he didn't. He went around, and as you see, he got trapped between Greenfield's car and the wall. Taze's car is already qualified. They're going to have a lot of work to do on that. 
Now it is Steve Butler who was on the racetrack during a qualification attempt when he lost control down in turn number one and also made significant contact with the wall. You know, it looks like he did absolutely nothing wrong. Something, now there's a little fire coming out from under the back of the car, but what it was that sent this car to the spin will forever be unknown. Now you can see the hit it takes and the frustrations that Butler, who fortunately was not injured in this one, he broke his collarbone in a crash earlier this month. You see the skid marks from the Greenfield Hayes crash right there. So this has become the Achilles heel of the track today as parts fly off that Stoops car. Last year, Steve Butler won both the USAC Sprint Car Championship and the Silver Crown Championship and hoped very much that he would be in this year's field. However, you can see the frustration that he had after the crash, no longer a contender in this year's field. Gary Lee was able to talk with Steve Butler. Steve, I have been around for some of the high spots of your career. Obviously, this is the lowest one. Yeah, Gary, it, it feels real low, uh, you know, to come here and... You know, start off the month so good and crash the first car and then uh, we just struggled to get this car going and then finally today we made a breakthrough, you know, at the last minute. In fact, you know, I'd almost given up hope that we were going to have a chance to qualify and we came here and we came here today and we're running uh, 213.8 and 213.9s and, and we felt like there was a little bit more there which we, you know, that would be qualifying speed. I think that a 213.5 will make the race and to go out there and, and crash right off the bat in the qualifying attempt. And, and the guys have worked so hard, you know, all month long. Jeff and Terry Stoops have spent a lot of money and uh, it's, it's not a good feeling. Tell us if you can what happened. Well, we, there's a little bit of a, uh oh, I, I changed my line today in an effort to find more speed. I started running under the white line, which I hadn't done before, you know, to, to kind of keep from scrubbing off so much speed in the turns and make the radius of the turn bigger. And it was working good. We did get some extra speed today. And uh, I mentioned to Chris, my crew chief, the, the last session out that there was a little bit of a slick spot there in one. And I was kind of skating through it, just a slight sideways slide but I didn't have to lift you know I mean I came here charged up you know this is the last day I'm gonna do whatever it takes to put this thing in the show and uh, you know I went out there that first lap and and I think that I just got so charged up to to go fast that I I drove right down into that slick spot flat out I should have felt it out first you know it may have been the tires may not have been all the way up to temperature, although I did run hard, you know, the, on the third and fourth turn. Or maybe the, the heat has made that slick spot a little bit slicker, but, you know, I was discharged up to, I was, my goal was I was going to hold the pedal down when I left the pits, and it wasn't coming up again until I saw the checker because I was going to put it in the show, and I just, I wish I would have let her up at least once. Steve but Butler will probably make the 500 someday, but not this year. It's all over for 1989. About an hour ago, Davy Jones went on to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the heat of the day and put himself back into the starting lineup. Now, he had earlier been bumped by John Paul Jr. with a speed of 211.475. John Paul Jr. had qualified at 211.969. However, Davy Jones, on his uh, third lap of qualifying, Qualifying, went up to a 214.516 mile an hour lap and his fourth lap will be even better than that and Jones is back in the starting lineup and in very good shape. It's amazing what, uh, what the adrenaline will do for you. Jones for a young driver has a wealth of experience. He's been very successful in international road racing driving for the Jaguar team and he'll be going to Le Mans next month for the 24 hours on the 11th of June which you'll be able to see parts of on ESPN. His fourth lap was 215.043 and the four lap average for Davy Jones 214.279 miles an hour and Davy Jones at the moment is second fastest of the day and in the middle of the 11th row. Yet to qualify today Scott Harrington, Rich Vogler, Tony Bettenhausen, Poncho Carter, also, Stan Fox, Steve Chassie, and Tom Bigelow. All of those drivers have not yet qualified. Now, look at this. It's the number 14 car. Obviously, it belongs to A.J. Foyt. It's his backup car. But notice the helmet. 
Does it look familiar to her? It's the Lone Star, and Johnny Rutherford is in this car, shaking it down. Johnny is second on the bubble right now. He's the second slowest in the field at 2.13. You know those Texans dudes kick together. Houston for Foyt, Fort Worth for Johnny Rutherford. They've always been friends, and here Foyt is coming to his buddy, his fellow Texans' rescue, so to speak. This is really precautionary because John is still in the race. Johnny Rutherford, of course, substituted for uh, A.J. Foyt a couple of years back at the Michigan 500. So if Johnny Rutherford does get in trouble in the car that he qualified earlier, he may try to qualify this car. We're live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on Bubble Day, and we'll be back with more right after this. Speedway where practice is going on no qualifiers at the moment on bubble day it's a very warm day here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and a huge crowd has turned out you know for the drivers and the crews this is serious business getting up to speed qualifying for the 500 mile race but the fans come here to have fun we sampled a little bit of their race car imitations <laughs> It's a new track record! <laughs> it's a new track record! <laughs> And it's fun at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I'm almost afraid to ask you this, but uh, what in the world was the most unusual thing you have ever seen here at the Speedway? Can you think back? Yeah, I just saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think our jobs as announcers are in jeopardy, but I'm, I'm glad they played that piece. It's a new track. I'm going to rehearse that. Piece, all right. Yeah. Johnny Rutherford earlier today made his way into the starting lineup in the 89 Lola Cosworth. This was about 1.35 this afternoon. He had turned in laps of 213.245 as wife Betty looked on. The second lap was 213.701. His third lap of qualifying for Johnny Rutherford was a little bit slower than the previous two. It was 213.134 miles an hour. Rutherford on his fourth and final lap of qualifying. You can see the backstretch speed there at 216 miles an hour and the fourth, third, and fourth corner speed of 208.5. And his fourth and final lap of qualifying was slower than the previous three as he came down and took the checkered flag from Dwayne Sweeney. The fourth lap was 212.314 miles an hour, giving him a four lap average of 213.097. And at the moment, he is second on the bubble after Phil Kruger. Gary Lee had an opportunity to talk with this three-time Indianapolis 500-mile winner after his successful qualification run earlier today. 
You lost, what, about four miles an hour after that practice session this morning? Was it a matter of track conditions? Ah, uh, yes, it, it is. It's uh, quite a bit warmer out there now than it than it was this morning, obviously, and the, the engine doesn't really care for that either because it, uh, you know, it just the efficiency of the engine goes down. So, and we picked up a little bit of a push, and that really kills these things. So it was a matter of getting out and and just running four smooth ones. I was a little disappointed that we didn't elevate instead of kind of holding our own and dropping off, but uh, that was all she'd do under the circumstances at this time, and I just hope it stands up and we can uh, get it in and get racing. It has been a very trying okay. month for a three-time champion, and as you indicated, now it's just a matter of waiting to see if the speeds, in fact, can go up as the track cools off later in the day. Yes, and uh, uh, they may at the end, you know, because it's uh, 5 o'clock, the guys that are in line, if somebody happens to find something, you know, it could be a little bit of a jeopardy, but uh, we've got some cushion. We'll just have to wait and see. And for the 25th ride in the 500, Lone Star JR, Johnny Rutherford. All right, Rutherford at the moment in the field. A bit of a problem has erupted on the number nine Ari Leyendijk car down in the pit area. There was a huge puff of smoke that came from that car and uh, obviously some water that has come from it. Well, Johnny Rutherford has always said it isn't where you start, it's where you finish. For the last four of six years, he has started in the last row and right now he starts in 33rd position. It's bubble day at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and we are live for the final one hour and 35 minutes of qualifying. No qualifiers at the moment. The track remains open for practice. Ari Leyendijk looks to be okay. There was a puff of smoke that came from that car down on the uh, pit road a while ago and uh, perhaps made his heart beat just a little bit faster. Larry Newber filed this report earlier this afternoon. Well, thank you. I'm in the infield hospital of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and this device is monitoring a person on the grounds, not a race car. This is J.P. Christensen. J.P. is the brains behind this. What's going on here, J.P.? Larry, as uh, with the Porsche team, uh, they are monitoring various different parameters of their car, for instance, the compression ratio, various different indices. What we're accomplishing with Ari, with the uh, Simon team, is determining as his heart would be his motor and looking how it would be functioning in various different situations. You are using the same kind of telemetry then that the Porsche team is, but you're looking, looking at a driver, not a car. Exactly. We're looking at a, a similar way to be able to transmit the data and to the base and to be uh, crunch the data and to see exactly how he is functioning, his heart is functioning. Well, you mentioned Ari. We're obviously talking about Ari Leyendijk, your driver. Ari, what are we reading here and what do you hope to do with it? Well, I hope that it gives me an indication of how my fitness uh, is and how my heart uh, and what kind of a shape it is. And uh, throughout the week, we've done some tests and it uh, looks like I'm in pretty good shape. Well, Ari, what are some of the body functions that we are monitoring? Well, we're really only looking at the heart. So the cardiovascular uh, output of it and uh, uh, how my heart rate goes up under certain uh, situations. Uh, for instance, you know, when you would be driving across along the highway and a deer crosses the road, you know, you have to get hard on the brakes, your heart rate goes up. Well, the same thing, we're trying to look at how it works out uh, on the racetrack, like when I come in the pits or uh, there's an accident and I'm like almost involved. And then reading all these, uh, uh, this information and uh, getting all the data together, I can uh, uh, train myself to uh, uh, get even into better shape. Teo Fabio has told us that he's not completely happy with the telemetry system on the Porsche because he says, well, I can't lie to the crew anymore. Is it embarrassing to have this on you? No, not really. I kind of knew coming in that uh, it would read out pretty positive. And there's a, there's a margin of about 10% we have to calculate that it's not, you know, it's not, on the, it's not exactly on the money. But it's, uh, it gives you, uh, you know, it's a 90% it's a bulletproof uh, thing. It's always pretty consistent in that manner. The medical condition of race drivers has been getting more and more attention every year. Is this a device that you feel as though will be on and inside of every car in the very near future? No, I don't think so because it's, uh, it's of course, it's quite complicated and also quite uh, expensive. Uh, we're just uh, trying to gather more data and this equipment has been used on uh, fighter pilots and see how they react to uh, G-forces. Well, we're having the same thing here through turn three uh, last week. Uh, we could measure on our race car that we were pulling four Gs. So we're going through a lot of stress uh, simply going this fast at high speeds, uh, you know, through the corners, I mean. 
That was Ari Leyendijk a couple of uh, hours ago. Meanwhile, Poncho Carter is standing near his uh, car as it is going through the technical inspection line. And that indicates to us that in just a few moments, when that car completes tech inspection, it will be pushed to the line, and Poncho Carter will attempt a qualification run. Now let's go to Gary Lee, who is with Ari Leyendijk. Well, Bob, Ari was out practicing, experienced a fire, so we thought, wow, we'll run down here, we'll check out that monitor and see just how fast the heartbeat went up and the pulse rate went up, but you tell me it wasn't hooked up right now. No, it wasn't hooked up, and the heart rate didn't go up that much because, uh, well, I felt the heat through the uh, popo valve tube, which is connected to the helmet. It was really getting hot in my ear, so I pulled that off uh, to start with, and then I looked in the mirror and I saw flames, so I, the engine quit. And I, I brought it in the pit so we could uh, put out the fire here and take the, the back of the car off. What caused the fire? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think one of the uh, fuel injectors broke off and sprayed fuel over the car, just like it did to me last year in uh, Milwaukee. But you're okay, except for a little warm when they're around the ear. Warm around the ear. But it got a little warm in the back again, too. Ari says he has to catch a flight in about 35 minutes, so he's going to change clothes and get out of here, Bob. Ari Leyendijk scheduled to start outside of row number five. The Pontiac Trans Am pace car is on the track as they inspect the surface because Tony Bentenhausen has apparently suffered some kind of an engine malfunction, but they are also checking the track because in just a few moments, we will have a qualification attempt here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway by Pancho Carter. We're glad you could join us on this fourth and final day. It's Bubble Day for the 73rd running of the Indianapolis 500. ESPN Speed World today at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for Bubble Day, the fourth and final day of qualifying for this year's 500-mile race. I'm Bob Jenkins along with Chrissy Konamaki, Larry Newber, and Gary Lee. The man on the bubble at the moment is Phil Kruger, who has a time of a speed, rather, of 212.458 miles an hour. We should have a qualification attempt from Pancho Carter in just a few moments. There is nothing going on on the racing surface at this moment. As a matter of fact, there is a track inspection going on so uh, it gives us an opportunity to examine the starting field a little bit closer row number one this year consists of Rick Mears Al Unser senior and Emerson Fittipaldi our pole man of course Rick Mears Rick Ravon Mears to be exact 38 years of age he's born in Wichita Kansas but now calls Bakersfield California and Reading Pennsylvania home we all know about Rick's three Indy wins, his record five pole positions and nine times in Indy's front row. That's the $156,000 he collected for winning a pole position here last week made him the all-time high money winner at this track with over $2.6 million in Indy winning. But what is interesting about this man is the way his connection with car owner Roger Penske came about. It was back in 1977 that Rick and Roger met in a man's outdoor outing, Wally Dallenbach, Colorado 5 a rough three-day motorcycle outing in the Rocky Mountains, riding the dusty trails all day, sitting by the campsites at night. The camaraderie that these two men developed at that outing led Penske to invite Mears to be his driver. The rest is history, as Mears is today considered not only a master of the oval track, but perhaps the best racing car doctor in history, given his ability to take a car and prescribe engine, mechanical, and aerodynamic changes to make it the fastest machine around Rick Ravon Mears favored to win number four here next Sunday in row number two driving an 87 Lola Buick is Jim Crawford then Mario Andretti in the middle and Scott Brayton on the outside of row two we picked 41 year old James Allen Crawford of Scotland as our second row choice to look at because of the tough luck he's had at this Cathedral of Speed his bone-breaking crash of two years ago left him hospitalized for many months and to this day, he walks with a cane. Last year, in his first race since that crash, he was the only non-Penske driver to lead the Indy 500, finally finishing sixth. Last weekend, he earned starting place number four. But on Thursday, while practicing at 220 miles an hour, the suspension part broke on his car, rocketing him into the outer wall with explosive force. Unhurt, Crawford exited the car, which suffered extensive damage. Stripped of its engine, transmission, and wheels, the tub, as the basic chassis is called, was airlifted to England, where it is at this moment undergoing repair. It'll be flown back Wednesday, 
and hopefully Crawford will have a chance to test it come Corporation Day Thursday and start fourth. If not, he'll have to move to the 33rd and last starting position in his backup car. So only time will tell where this smiling Scotsman will start the 500 next Sunday. In row number three will be Bobby Rahal driving a Lola Cosworth, Allenzer Jr. in a Lola Chevy, and Raul Boisel in a Lola Judd. It was back in 1986, a wide awake Robert Woodward Rahal won the Indy 500 in a dramatic late race move past Kevin Cogan. It was a surprise ending and launched the 36-year-old driver of Lebanese descent into big business. One of the few IndyCar drivers with a college degree, Ray Hall used his fame and his fortune to establish a Honda dealership in the unlikely town of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, far from his home on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio. Despite winning consecutive national championship titles with his friend Jim Truman's troop sports team in 1986 and 1987, Ray Hall changed horses for the 1989 season replacing Michael Andretti on Maury Crane's Craco team. Bobby's 219.530 mile an hour qualifying run is the fastest of all the Cosworth engines in this year's 500 field. And Bobby Rahal has won a total of 18 championship races. Now in row number four will be A.J. Foyt, Randy Lewis, and John Andretti. The name Andretti usually means Mario, or perhaps Michael. But the Andretti we're looking at is a nephew and cousin of the aforementioned men, John Andrew Andretti. Struggling in the shadows of his illustrious relatives, John honed his driving skills, first in stock cars in his native Nazareth, Pennsylvania, and then after moving to Indianapolis so he could be close to the busy midget and sprint car scene. His racing travels have carried him far in miles, but not in fame, driving in Australia and New Zealand. But finally, his big break came after some impressive drives last year in an underfinanced team and a freak crash at Pocono. His breadth of talent is shown by the record books at Daytona and West Palm Beach, Florida, where he co-drove to victory earlier this year in IMSA road races. His indie hopes rest with the son of the man who provided the sponsorship for his uncle Mario when he won back in 1969, Vince Granatelli. Keep your eye on John Andretti in the bright red number 70 tune-up Masters Buick engine Lola come Sunday. And back live now at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where Poncho and his wife Carla Carter wait for him to get into the race car and attempt a qualification run. And there is also a meeting of other drivers going on. Johnny Rutherford included in this group. Allen's her junior there on the right. Derek Daly moves in to talk with A.J. Foyt. George Snyder is also there. Vince Granatelli, who of course owns the car that John Andretti will run in this year's Indianapolis 500. A qualification run from Poncho Carter is coming up in just a few moments on Bubble Day. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where the track is silent because of a track inspection, we anticipate a qualification run from Poncho Carter in just a few moments. Poncho Carter is getting strapped into his car right now and receiving the instructions from Chief Steward Tom Benford before going out onto the racetrack. Well, there was also a... Uh rather interesting race this afternoon at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Of course, they will host the uh, World Coca-Cola 600 also a week from Sunday, the same day that this uh, race is run. And they uh, began their racing action this weekend with the running of the Winston. We'll tell you more about in just a moment. Right now, let's go down to Larry Newber. Well, Bob and Chris, this is one of the most important moments in Pancho Carter's career. Pancho Carter is a man who has practiced at above 217 miles per hour. He once sat on the pole here. He did not make this race last year. He crashed twice in the final weekend when he was expected to get in then. This also is the third attempt on this car. This is the frontline car. This is the one they want to put in. This is an incredible emotional moment for Pancho. He needs a speed of 212.458 to get into the field and bump Bill Kruger. Now we mentioned the Winston at Charlotte Motor Speedway earlier today. Rusty Wallace had won segment number one of the Winston and Daryl Waltrip had won the second leg of the Winston at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Now in the final 20 lap event, there's Daryl Waltrip spinning after being nudged by Rusty Wallace and Daryl slides into the infield grass. Rusty Wallace went on to win that final leg of the Winston 
and become the overall winner. But look what happens as Rusty pulls into victory lane. There's a huge fight that breaks out between members of the Wallace crew and the Daryl Waltrip crew. Les Richter says the fights in the pits are being looked at and disciplinary measures may be considered. They do not anticipate any action for incidents on the racetrack. The top five finishers in the Winston, Rusty Wallace was the winner, Ken Schrader second, Dale Earnhardt third, Bill Elliott fourth, and Alan Kowicki finishes in fifth position. So that's what happened this afternoon at the Charlotte. Again, a very controversial race. It looked to me like a student demonstration in Beijing, I thought, there for a moment. Well, a much uh, more pastoral, shall we say, setting here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There's certainly a lot of emotion inside Poncho Carter and a lot of anticipation from this team. Can he make his way into the starting lineup for the 500? We'll know in just a matter of moments. You know, Poncho's uh, comes from a long line of racing people. His father is Dwayne Carter, a man who had a very close association with personally. That was Dwayne Carter's mechanic on these outboard midgets throughout the 1938 season. Uh, Poncho's half-brother is Johnny Parsons, Jr., and that is another family that's steeped in racing. Johnny's dad won the Indy 500 back in 1950. There's not any rivalry between these fellows. In fact, it's a great friendship. But for Poncho, who's a former sprint car and dirt track champion, missing last year's race was a tough blow to take, and he's trying now to make up for that and get in the competition. And the pressure is definitely on. Remember, there's only one chance left for this car. If he doesn't make it now, the car is put away till next year. He's trying to make his 15th Indianapolis 500 mile race. Back in 1977, he suffered bad injuries in a test run at Phoenix on the mile there during the month of December, and uh, he was out of racing for quite a while, but has made a uh, gallant comeback, and now Poncho Carter attempts to make his 15th Indianapolis 500 mile race. Lap number one of warm-up is completed. He'll have to take the green flag next time around, or he'll be called in. Again, the speed he's shooting for is 200 12.458 miles an hour, and that is Phil Kruger's current time. We'll see uh, and get an indication here in just a moment, perhaps, of how he is doing on the warm-up lap. He's moving through the north end of the raceway. The crew will signal to official starter Dwayne Sweeney whether or not they want him to take the green flag. As he comes down, the green flag is out indeed, and Poncho Carter is on his qualification run. The third attempt for this car, so he'll go ahead and take it. Now that he's uh, officially taken the green flag, his previous two attempts have been in the 2.12 mile an hour range. The first attempt was a 2.12.039, and the second attempt, 2.12.3. 349 so had he taken those uh, runs it would have been very questionable because he's looking now for a 212.4 I think he's looking for more than that, uh, Bob, because there's some guys in line there that are going to take shots at him once he takes the second flag. Off of corner number four, here comes Poncho Carter moving to the middle of the racetrack to cross the line and complete lap number one. Carla, his wife, looks on. She has the stopwatch going, and she seems to think that it's good enough. Indeed, it is good enough to make Poncho Carter a member of the 33-car starting field. The time, 42. 2.156 seconds and the speed is 213.493 it's more than a mile an hour more than he needs to jump to bump bill krueger from the lineup smooth driver his great achievements however have come on dirt tracks the difference between dirt and asphalt is truly remarkable he's adapted very well to the hard pan here is the second lap completed for Poncho Carter. He's halfway around on the four-lap attempt. The second lap is quicker than the first. Poncho's got a good run going in this leader card sponsored race car with Hardy's also on the side. It's a 42.067 second lap and 213.944. You know, I look at Poncho Carter in the 1950 Minnesota State Fair. I babysat for him, and during the course of my babysitting, I had to change his diapers a couple of times. <laughs> there he is off of corner number four, about to complete lap number three. The white flag is showing for Poncho Carter. His run at the moment averages 213.7. 
number three is faster. He's up in the 214 mile an hour range. Time 41.963 seconds. And the third lap speed for Pancho Carter is 214.475. So if he can turn in a lap in that speed range, he has got it made and in the field easily for this year's 500. And Phil Kruger is buffed from the lineup. Here's Carter off of corner number four. Looks like he's going to be a successful qualifier. The checkered flag is waiting. Dwayne Sweeney waves it. And Pancho Carter is in the field. And Carla Carter is ecstatic. There's the happy bride, Carla. You had to live with him last year when he crashed twice. He missed the show the first time in 15 years. We can see the tears under the sunglasses. Congratulations. How do you feel right now? Oh, and a big hug. I'm so happy. I'm so proud of him. He's worked so hard these last two weeks. The whole crew has. And it's paid off. How has his demeanor been the past few days? Surprisingly, he's been very well. He um, He's never stopped plugging away. That's one thing about him. He never gives up. Well, from a racing family, her father had sprint cars for a number of years. Now she has a couple of little boys that we may see in a race car in the years to come. A very happy Carla Carter. Fourth lap was 214.357 and the four lap average speed for Pancho Carter was 214.067. Bill Kruger is bumped from the lineup. Back live at Indianapolis, Poncho Carter has just qualified. A big hug and a kiss for his wife. His dad, Dwayne Carter, an 11-time starter here, also here. Poncho with a hug. Congratulations. It took a lot of uh, effort. It's been a trying month for you. Well, it certainly has. Uh, the Hardy's Lola just hasn't been performing the way uh, the whole crew had wanted it to. And everybody's worked. They were there till 3 o'clock last night, put new engines in both this and the 2014 car. And uh, the crew did all of it. I just, uh, you know, they worked hard. All I did is get the maximum out of it in this run and then we felt like that the car is always a little better when it's cool and it is and the car just uh, it performed beautifully during the run was there any ever a thought this month of deja vu you missed the race last year after crashing twice you had to think is it going to happen again yeah every day since last sunday every minute and here's the proud papa right over here this is Dwayne carter senior Dwayne is an 11-time starter, and I'll tell you what, I think it's easier for you to be in a race car than to stand here and watch the kid qualify. And that's right. When you're in the seat, you're the boss of everything. When you're out here, you're not the boss, so you're very curious, very concerned as a parent as to just what's going on. And I know he was going to try as hard as he could, as hard as his heart would let him try, and he did supremely well. A happy family here, the Carters, Dwayne, Poncho, and Carla. Poncho moves to the middle of row number 11, and now the driver on the bubble is Johnny Rutherford, who qualified earlier today. His speed, 213.097, and there is Johnny. Remember, he has taken out the A.J. Foyt backup car in the last few minutes, so, so perhaps if he does get bumped here in the next few minutes, he will try to qualify that 14T. And Rich Vogler is on the racetrack. He is warming up right now. We'll be back with his qualification attempt live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where Rich Vogler is about to complete lap number one on his qualification run. He's trying to bump his way into the starting field. And he's after a 213.097 held by Johnny Rutherford. Rich Vogler completes lap number one. He's at the south end of the racetrack. The speed he has turned on lap one is not good enough. It's 42.575 seconds, 211.392. That's uh, a tough break for Rich Vogler. He's the son of a racing driver, Don Vogler, who was killed in a race at Indianapolis Speed Drum. Rich has got an appetite for racing that just won't quit. So far this year, he's flown to California three times to be on ESPN's Thursday Night Thunder. And he drives all kinds of cars on all kinds of tracks, usually faster uh, from a percentage standpoint than he's going here. He is driving the 29T car. There are no strikes against it. Lap number two completed for Rich Vogler. And lap number two is faster than lap number one, but it's still not good enough. Second lap, 42.467 seconds, and the speed for Rich Vogler is 211.929. So he's approaching that 212 mark, but still needs much more than that to get into the field. 
He has previously driven in four Indy 500s. His best start was 11th back in 1987. His best finish was last year when he finished 17th, although he was knocked out of the race in an accident. And the yellow flag comes out. They are waving him off of the qualification run. And Johnny Rutherford is still on the bubble, but breathes a little sigh of relief. You wonder, it's an hour and five minutes, so that 6 o'clock gun goes off. And Rutherford, the heart meter should be on Johnny Rutherford. Hard, not the men in the cars. Johnny standing there with uh, George Snyder and other members of the A.J. Foyt team. They will have a decision to make should Johnny get bumped from the lineup in his car number 98, the Glidden sponsor car that he has in the field right now. So Rich Fogler turns in two laps in the 211 mile an hour range, but they wave him off of it. The speed just not good enough to get into the starting lineup. And apparently there are no other cars in line at the moment. In fact, nobody up in the technical inspection area. So that would mean apparently that we're going to open the track for practice once again. Rich Vogler brings the car into the pit area. You can see his other car also up there in that general vicinity. So, once again, we have a lull in the action here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with no qualifications being run at the moment. We're live for Bubble Day, fourth day of qualifying. We're back live at Indianapolis for the fourth and final day of qualifying, and Lone Star JR, I think you have tried every experience possible here, and right now you're riding the bubble, but you text and stick together. You're about to climb into A.J. Foyt's backup car to take some laps. Yes, uh, A.J.'s been kind enough to let me take this T-car out and, uh, and shake it down a little bit, and it, it feels very good. And I uh, just hope for the sake of my Glidden crew that uh, we don't get bumped, but we're on the bubble right now, and it's it's exasperating. It's the first time I've ever been in that position, so uh, just we'll have to see what happens. If uh, we get down in line and uh, and uh, wait out to, to see what happens, if we don't get bumped, then, then good enough. But if I do and the other car, then they have uh, said I could to take A.J.'s car and take a ride in it and see how it goes. You have a good game face, but down here you have to be churning. Well, I guess that's uh, probably a true statement. Well, also a visitor today, a lady that would like to be here qualifying next year, Lynn St. James, standing by with Larry Newber. Well, Gary, that's right. You know, Janet Guthrie, a little more than a decade ago, broke the sex barrier. She has raced in the Indianapolis 500. Lynn, you never have. Would you like to? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. Have you ever seen pressure, however, like this? This is unlike anything else in the world, and you have raced literally around the world. Well, I have, and I'm excited because I'm on my way. After I, I'll be back here for race weekend, and then I'm going to Le Mans to race in the 24 hours of Le Mans in a uh, Spice factory car. Uh, but I think being here and kind of watching this tension and feeling this tension is a good, it's a good exercise for me to go through. There's nothing like it in the world, I think, as the Indianapolis 500, and I've worked hard to get the experience and the credentials that would qualify me for, to, to be just to get a shot at it. So uh, I'm glad to be able to be here and experience it and then get to try it for real. You know, Lynn, literally hundreds of drivers aspire to do this, and hundreds of drivers have been champions in many forms of road racing, oval track racing. How good do you realistic, realistically think your chances are right now? It's a long shot, I have to say. I, I have such respect for what it takes to get here and all the elements. I'm not talking just about the experience, even though that's the most important, but the funding and the team and the whole support system that you need. So I know it's a long shot, but I drove, I got to finally drive an IndyCar in my gut. Now it tells me I can do it, so the fire is in my belly to do it. Well, Bob, uh, our qualifying speeds here, 210, 215, 220, and Lynn St. James has driven that fast before in a full-bodied race car on a 2.6666 mile racetrack. Well, we wish her a lot of luck, and we have a crash in turn number two. It looks like that Johnny Parsons has crashed Steve Celine's backup car. Now, Steve crashed yesterday and was not released by the medical personnel to compete, so they brought out the backup car, and Johnny, rather, rather Johnny Parsons has been driving it, and now Parsons winds up against the second turn wall. We can see, however, that he is climbing from the race, uh, race car, so apparently not injured. Nevertheless, another crash. Uh, it's getting tough this last day. Always leads to things like this, but cars that aren't really quite right for the track being pushed beyond their capabilities by overeager drivers. This, this is going to delay things for a while, and of course, Johnny Rutherford couldn't be happier. 
We are now within the final hour of qualifying, and Gary Lee is standing by in the pit area. Well, Bob and Chris, Johnny only has about 20 laps in that car. He took it out this morning, a few shakedown runs. He got up to 210. They trimmed out the wings. He went back out, said he felt very comfortable and felt like he could flat-foot it into the show. So perhaps he was just simply overextending the race car just a bit to find that extra yeah. speed. Yeah, and uh, turn two has certainly been the uh, area that the crashes have occurred in today. There is Didier Taze, who is... Uh, in another one of his cars, he crashed one earlier today in that area of the racetrack. You remember that uh, Johnny Parsons got into A.J. Foyt's car last year in uh, the qualification procedure and also uh, had a misfortune with it. And now he's into the second turn wall in uh, Steve Celine's car. Didier Tays yeah. sits and waits for the track to reopen for uh, another practice period. Well, Tays had some bad luck this morning in this crash. That's Michael Greenfield You're about to lose it here in the slow motion. Ocean, and you can see DDA Taze coming around. The car that Taze is driving, fortunately, is his backup car. He qualified the sister car to this. So this accident where he was trapped against the outside wall by the spinning rookie Michael Greenfield is not going to affect his primary ride, but it may shake him up a little bit. Road racers from Belgium, I guess, are not used to wheel-to-wheel -wheel competition. They expect the car to do things for them, not so much the driver. There's a good look at the, the man from Belgium. And let's go down to Larry Nuber. Well, the car that Didier is sitting in right now is the one that you just watched crash. It was his backup car that he crashed. It's the backup car that he is sitting in. They repaired it. They had to change most of the pieces that stick out on the right side, plus an entirely new rear end was affixed to this machine this afternoon. So the crew has done some extremely hard work. He's third in the bump list right now. You know, it's kind of rare to see a two-car crash during a practice session. Uh, we've been kind of thinking back, and the last one we can remember was in 1974 when Tom Bigelow and Scott Brayton got together, but they are rather rare. This one that we're watching right now, the aftermath, is a single car crash in turn number two involving Johnny Parsons in Steve Celine's backup machine. You know, it's rather surprising to see so many crashes because with this new asphalt and even the great speeds, the exception of uh, <coughs> uh, Steve Butler's crash early this month and then later Danny Sullivan and Jim Crawford, there's been very few crashes until this weekend. And the ones we've seen have been minor. But there's been many, far fewer crashes during the month of May this year than in any month of May in recent years. Teo Fabi moves into the pit area. He was on the track while uh, this incident occurred, and now he has brought the Quaker Stake Buick back into the pit area. So we are under a uh, track cleanup at the moment. Johnny Parsons has crashed in turn number two. We'll be right back. The number 59 Auto Express car is on the hook, headed back to the garage area. Looking at it on this side, there doesn't appear to be much damage, but on the right side of the car, there is extensive damage as Johnny Parson tasted the wall over in turn number two while the track was uh, under a uh, practice session. Now let's go back and review some more of the rows. And the starters for this year's Indianapolis 500. Row five consists of Teo Fabi, Gary Bettenhausen, and Ari Leyendijk, two of the three foreign-born drivers. Another familiar your name in our lineup is found in the middle of that fifth row, Gary Clyde Bettenhausen, the son of a man whose career paralleled that of the great British A. Sterling Moss, who, like the elder Bettenhausen, Tony won everything except what he wanted, the World Championship. Gary's father, Tony, gave his life here in 1963, trying for that all-elusive Indy 500 victory. And Gary, his oldest son, has been trying to reach the same goal for the last 17 years. He came so close in 1972 when his car failed with 18 laps to go after he had lapped the field and led for 138 of those laps. Despite a left arm that hangs virtually lifeless at his side, the result of a Syracuse sprint car accident many years ago, Gary Bettenhausen is trying once again to put the Bettenhausen name on the Board Warner Trophy. Gary 
Gary Benton housing starting in the middle of row number five. Well, another interesting thing about bubble day, the fourth day of qualifying, deals are being made. Drivers are going to other owners and saying, can I take your car? Here's Larry Newber. Well, Bob, here is the latest deal. You see Rich Vogler suiting up. He just walked down the pit road with Mike Fannin and Andy Kenapensky of the Machinist Union. He is getting ready to buckle inside of Kevin Kogan's backup car. Rich Vogler is still in very great spirits. He was joking and laughing with me just before he put his hat on. And he's ready to go out in the backup car that Kevin Kogan is practicing all month of May. Think about this. Never been in a car before. He's going to have a couple of laps, whatever length this practice period is, and then try to qualify it. This is like marrying a girl you met 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but this is one of the interesting things, I think, about Bubble Day. Not only do you have drivers who are trying to work their own cars up to speed, but in this final hour, you see guys going up to other team owners and team managers and saying, can I take your car out for a run, and can I qualify it if I get up to speed? We're seeing that uh, right now, and we'll probably see it throughout the rest of the hour. Well, this is really a colorful part of this day, and over the years, that tradition has been scrambling up and down pit road. No, you really approach didn't do you any good because the numbers and the names didn't match after four o'clock on final Sunday. All right, so Rich Vogler will go out into this car for a shakedown run in just a few moments as the man on the bubble for this year's 500-mile race is Johnny Rutherford, and he awaits to see what happens in the next 50 minutes. <laughs> now we go to row number six in our review of the field. The members of that row are Terrell Palmroth, Rookie Scott Pruitt in the middle and Ludwig Heimrath Jr. outside. Scott Donald Pruitt is a household name among followers of road racing in this country. After all, he easily won three straight sedan championships. MCGTO in 1986, SCCA Trans Am in 1987, and GTO again in 1988. But finds that open wheel racing is certainly no picnic. As the replacement for Bobby Rahal on the famed Budweiser Two Sports Lola Judd, Pruitt has been struggling in his first year here at Indy, but is confident he will show well once the green flag falls Sunday. Scott Pruitt qualified at 213.955 and is right now in the middle of row number six. Still under a caution on the racetrack because of the crash over in turn number two involving Johnny Parsons. We are live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and we'll be back with more right after this. Cleanup continuing in turn number two from a crash involving Johnny Parsons just a few moments ago in Steve Celine's backup car. And speaking this about Steve, he is with our Gary Lee down on pit road. And Bob, Chris, he is very somber. We thought maybe we would talk to you during a qualification attempt by Johnny Parsons. First of all, physically, how do you feel? Well, obviously, I'm very disappointed. I'm very upset. Uh, I heard that he got out of the car on his own, so we were on our way over to the medical to make sure that he's in good shape. But the reason he was in the car is because you had some back problems from yesterday's crash. Yes, the, um, I hit the turn four wall, so I know exactly how he must feel right now. Obviously a very disappointing conclusion to what has been a very disappointing, trying, frustrating month. We, um, yeah, we, we came in, we went through the rookie orientation, we came through that with flying colors, no blown motors, ran one of the fastest laps ever for a rookie first time here at the Speedway. We came into the month and I've gone through three blown motors and two crashed cars within two weeks period of time. And obviously I knew it was gonna be difficult coming in and uh, we just now figured out exactly how difficult it is. And people said Indianapolis is a very tough track and I'll tell you, we've learned the hard way. Does the frustration at this point override your desire to think about coming back for next year? No, not at all. In fact, if anything, if uh, they'll know about myself and even the Celine organization that I'll guarantee we'll, we'll be back a year from now and we'll be better prepared to deal with the circumstances are dealt with here. Our sponsors with Montgomery Ward and Pioneer are behind us on a long-term effort and I can assure you that this is only the first inning. For the race fan that may take their car into the body shop for a fender bender, how much money do you think you've lost this weekend in two race cars? I, I, I couldn't even speculate. You don't than, want to think about I, it. I'd rather not think about that right now. All right, we'll let you go check on JP's condition. Thank, Thank you. you. 
It is the greatest spectacle in racing, and it isn't tough to make your way into the starting field. Johnny Rutherford having a conversation with uh, Goodyear's Leo Mel, who and is there in the glasses. And speed sport news photographer Dennis Torres in the striped shirt. And again, Johnny Rutherford is on the bubble with a 213.097. The track is quiet right now, so not even anyone practicing and trying to work up to speed. Well, we continue our review of the rows in number seven. It's Didier Tays, a rookie, Bernard Jourdain, a rookie. And on the outside of row number seven is Michael Andretti. Well, our seventh row pick to look at is Belgian rookie Didier Tays of Brussels. His luck changed for the bad in this morning's practice session when he came upon the spinning car of rookie Michael Greenfield during practice. With nowhere to go, Taze nosed into Greenfield's car and his RCR wine special suffered suspension and body damage as the two cars ground away at the wall. Though not injured, the former Benelux Formula 4 champion <coughs> is now faced with starting a car after having hit the wall, uh, a frightening experience. It'll be a tough task for this first time Indy 500 starter if he makes it. Here with 45 minutes of qualifying to go, his 213.120 mile an hour qualifying speed is third on the bump list and he has to be worried. Didier Tays, one of four rookies in this year's starting lineup. And the word from the Hanna Medical Center is that Johnny Parsons was not injured and has been uh, released to do some more driving if he chooses to do so. Well, the qualifying line is beginning to form. Cars are moving to the inspection area, so the track should be open for qualifications in just a few more minutes. at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and there is the car that is going through technical inspection at the moment. That's the car of Michael Greenfield, so he will be the next to attempt qualification. You can see some of the measurements and the uh, technical checks that the USAC officials uh, take these cars through every time they attempt to run. Well, Greenfield is an interesting driver because his experience has been in club racing and the, the ARS, and he's been very fortunate. He won the ARS race at Pocono last year, but there are a number of people who feel that he's had too limited experience to belong here. It would be interesting to hear his comments on that if one of our pit side interviewers can get to Michael Greenfield. He's a good-looking guy. His father's a big supporter of his, and he's from New York City. And when the series moves to the Meadowlands, he'll be a big ticket seller there, I'm sure. He won the first oval race that he ever participated in so Michael Greenfield has been okay to drive here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and we might mention that each driver that come here does undergo a rookie test in which he has to run laps and within a certain speed category and then he has to be okayed by drivers who observe him on the racetrack now here is another driver that is trying to get into the field and that is Steve Chassis driving car number 97 he undoubtedly will make a qualification attempt in the next 40 or so minutes. Let's go to Gary Lee, who's with Michael Greenfield. Indeed, in the tech line, as the car is being teched right now, we're going to try to tech his emotions as a rookie. It is late, perhaps your only opportunity. How do you feel right now? Well, you know, I am a bit nervous about it, and anybody would be. Uh, especially since I, I did loop the car this morning, and we did a little bit of damage to it. I'm not sure if it's going to be right for the run, but we're going to take our chances. And, you know, this is, uh, you don't have too many more opportunities. There's only about a half an hour left. It's got to be now and ever. But how much self-discipline do you have right now? And be honest with me. You want to go out there, white knuckle it, hold your breath? Are you going to be sane enough to say, let's check it out for a lap to see if this car is really working? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident. You know, we managed to get some time out in the green just before this, and it was just a question of a few tweaks here and there to get the car just perfect. So, but I think it's going to be good. He's ready, and the car shortly will also be ready. Before the crash this morning, Michael Greenfield had turned a lap at 213.1. He needs a 213.0 to get his way into the starting lineup. Now, here is Steve Chassie, and Steve, of course, will be uh, with us on our Thursday night sprint and midget races from the Indianapolis Speedrome, the first of which is this coming Thursday night. You know, it's interesting to see Greenfield come here. It reflects the acceptance that the sport of auto racing is enjoying these days, social, commercial, and media. Rarely did you ever find anybody from the New York City area becoming a racing driver. Taxi driver, maybe, but not a racing driver. And here we have somebody from the biggest city in the world coming out here to buy his trade as an auto racer. 
Well, the track remaining open for practice. Now, there on the scoring pylon, you can uh, see that the field has been filled as Rich Vogler goes out onto the two and a half miles in Kevin Kogan's backup car. It's rather interesting to note that at the top of the scoring pylon is a three-time winner, Rick Mears, and on the bottom is the number 98 car driven by Johnny Rutherford, and he is a three-time winner. So we got a three-time winner starting first and one starting in last position. Johnny Rutherford only has to hang on for four. 40 more minutes, and he's in the 500. The gun goes off promptly at 6 o'clock, and the way the rules read, if somebody goes out just moments before 6, he can't complete the qualifying run. So qualifying just doesn't necessarily end here at 6, but it cannot start after. It's an exciting few hours, a few minutes here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There's Rich Vogler getting the feel of Kevin Kogan's backup machinist union car. We are live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on Bubble Day, the fourth and final day, and we've got about 40 more minutes remaining. We'll be right back. Back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where the musical chairs of race cars continues. That is Johnny Rutherford, as predicted earlier on this broadcast, getting behind the wheel of the A.J. Foyt backup car. This is a one-year-old Lola, a 1987 Lola that A.J. warmed up a little bit earlier in the month. George Schneider was going to step behind the wheel, but he graciously stepped aside, we were told, a few moments ago when Johnny Rutherford said, Hey, A.J., I need some help. And the question becomes, who, if anyone, can bump Johnny from the lineup in his original car? Now, Michael Greenfield will be the first to try, and Rich Vogler will undoubtedly put his car in the technical inspection line, Kevin Kogan's backup car. Who do you think? Can anyone bump Johnny out of the lineup? Well, I think if they can get the car suitable for Rich Vogler, you know, Kevin Kogan is a head taller than Rich Vogler, and I just can't see Rich Vogler slipping into that car and even reaching the pedal. So they're going to have to make some last-minute adjustments to the car so he fits it. And if they're done properly, I think Rich might be able to do it. If not, he won't be. Well, we'll know in a few moments there is Johnny in that A.J. Foyt car ready to go when uh, he is called upon to do so. But again, the car must go through technical inspection before it is allowed to qualify. The Pontiac Trans Am pace car with USAC officials in it making a final track inspection before the green light goes on and the qualification attempt by Michael Greenfield. And they look closely at the track circuit. Anything that they see, they uh, will go and pick up. Well, let's continue to uh, review the rows as they stand now for the 500-mile race. In row number eight, it's Tom Sneva, a former winner, and also two-time winner Gordon Johncock. On the outside of the eighth row is Derek Daly. If it weren't for one Gordon Walter Johncock, Rick Mears would today be a four-time Indianapolis 500-mile race winner. The pair came to the checkered flag in 1982 in a soul-stirring wheel-to-wheel battle that the Hastings Michigan driver won by the closest margin in the history of the race, 16 one-hundredths of a second, amidst resounding cheers from the huge Midwestern crowd. But John Cocker has had as many downs as ups, forcing him into a hasty retirement announcement after practicing for the 1985 500, but quickly realizing after filing for personal bankruptcy that he needed the kind of money racing pays. Sunday's 500 will be John Cocker's 22nd and first in a Buick engine car. Gordon Johncock, last year here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, was bumped in the final hour of qualifying and uh, was not able to compete in the race. And a former winner bumped, and it could be that a former winner is bumped from this year's, namely Johnny Rutherford. Let's go back down to Larry Newber. Well, Bob and Chris, the, uh, the next member of the chorus of the musical chairs, Tony Bettenhausen, steps behind the wheel of Poncho Carter's backup car. You know, they had such a hard time getting Poncho into the field. Now that he's in safely, it's a member of one of those families of racing in America, and Tony is in Poncho's backup. Well, Gary, of course, Tony's brother is already in the field in the middle of row number five, and Tony would like to make it two Bettenhausens in this year's 500-mile field. So that story is continuing to develop down there as we await Michael Greenfield to go on to the uh, track for a qualification attempt. In row number nine, it's John Jones, then Danny Sullivan, who qualified yesterday at 216.0, and Kevin Kogan at 214.5. Well, the nickname of Daniel John Sullivan of Louisville may soon change from Broadway Danny to Iron Man. 
For this smiling Irishman who drove to victory in 1985 500 and prefers the social side of the sport to the automotive will face his toughest 500 Sunday. A high-speed wall crash thanks to the bodywork blowing off his highlight Penske a week ago Thursday left Sullivan with a broken right forearm. Orthopedic surgery during which a metal plate was put in his arm quickly followed. Then, a custom cast was designed that offered protection for the broken bone, yet allowed him to steer and ship. Yesterday, the 1988 National Driving Champion qualified for this year's 500. But the question remains, will his arm be able to stand the stress and strain of 500 long miles here? If so, Iron Man is the likely new Subaru K for this 39-year-old bachelor. And it'll be interesting on race day to watch Danny Sullivan move through the field from his starting position of the middle of row number nine. Danny Sullivan has uh, successfully qualified yesterday for the 500-mile race, and now Michael Greenfield has fired the engine on his car, and he, too, hopes to make his way into the field, but he'll have to bump Johnny Rutherford to do it, and the speed that he's shooting for is 213.097. We'll be back with his qualification run right after this. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where Michael Greenfield in car number 63 is on the racetrack in a warm-up lap. A qualification attempt is underway by Michael. Greenfield from the state of New York was born in Whitestone, New York as a manufacturing company supervisor when not pursuing his career as a professional race driver. This will be the first of two warm-up laps for Michael. The top speed for this car this month, 213.118. And that's just barely enough to get into the starting lineup. Now, Michael started driving Formula 4s in SCCA regional competition back in 1982, moved into the national Formula Ford series in 1983. Driving Formula Atlantic in 85, he ran four races, won two, three pole positions, and finished second in the SCCA national championship runoffs. As Chris earlier mentioned, he won the Pocono ARS race last year. He also finished seventh at Laguna and ninth at Nazareth and finished 10th in the ARS point standings. The green flag comes out and Michael Greenfield's run is underway. Smoothly down into turn number one. Keeping the car well off that short shoot wall between the first and second corners the back stretch. Michael Greenfield. This car has one attempt against it. A 210.084 run a week ago. He's in turn number three at the north end of the racetrack. And there, a 208.507 speed in the uh, north end of the racetrack between turns three and four. Here's the completion of lap number one for Michael Greenfield. 213.0 is what he needs. Let's see if he has it on lap number one. It is not nearly fast enough. First lap is 43.4 seconds and the speed only 207.235 and Michael knows it he is off the accelerator already and we will be pulling in and calling off this attempt so Johnny Rutherford remains safe for the time being and I don't believe there are any other cars in the technical inspection line at the moment. And this is rather unusual for uh, a final hour of qualifying. Normally, there are cars that are moving through here quickly to get a chance at it. His dad, Peter, looks on. But Michael not able to get the car up to sufficient speed to make this year's field. So he pulls back into the uh, pit area. And I would guess that the track is once again going to open for practice as nobody else is in, in the technical inspection line. Now there's Peter Greenfield talking to his son. Now they ought to do what A.J. Foyt did yesterday, one of his cars, change the gear ratio, put a growler in it, <laughs> and go for broke. Watch Pete. 
So with uh, once again the uh, lull in the action here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, we continue our review of the rows. In row number 10, Rocky Moran starts in one of A.J. Foyt's cars along with Dominic Dobson and last year's Rookie of the Year, Billy Bukovic III. We're looking at Rocky Moran, a big guy, the kind of guy A.J. Foyt likes, six foot three, 210 pounds, but he's a graduate of the sports cars. Ran the Can-Am series back in 78 and 79. But he came to IndyCar racing in 1981 and at his very first IndyCar start at the tricky Watkins Glen course in New York, he led the race and looked like a sure winner until the car ran out of fuel. Come here several years and done well, but this year he didn't have a good run and A.J. Foyt at the last minute put him in the car. And when it wasn't going up to speed, they brought the car into the pits, changed the gears, let the engine scream against its will, and Rocky Moran went out. And when the checkered flag came down, he was in the field for the 1989 Indianapolis 500. He said his friend Foyt told him to go for broke, and that's what he did. He took the checkered flag and brake the engine did, moments after taking the checkered flag. And A.J. Foyt, playing car owner in this instant, had a big smile. There he is, A.J. walking across the track, and there's two-time winner Roger Ward to congratulate him on that. A.J. Foyt, a fine car owner and a lucky man as well, talking to some of the old-timers, A.J. Watson there, and Rocky Moran makes the race. And Johnny Rutherford is on the racetrack in another A.J. Foyt car just in case he needs to try to get back in the lineup. At the moment, Rutherford is on the bubble in his car number 98 Glidden sponsored machine, but A.J. is allowing him to go out and shake this car down so that if he does need it to qualify and get back into the field, he will have the opportunity to. You know, it's interesting, Bob, through all of the four days of qualification, the white line has not been mentioned once. It was the big story leading up to the first qualifying weekend about the drivers were all upset about the rule that said you can't put four wheels under it. Petitions were filed and delivered to USAC and reviews were promised. And it's not been an issue at all. It's interesting how quickly something can fade from view once it's not an issue. There is Rich Vogler who is in Kevin Kogan's backup car. And this is going to be an interesting few moments. Obviously, Vogler is seeing what this car will do if he turns a lap in excess of 213 miles an hour he will bring that car in immediately put it through the tech line and get out there on the racetrack and try to qualify in the final 25 minutes Vogler bumped earlier today Vogler has not made the field yet but is uh, is trying to do so and Larry Newber is down in the pit area with another driver who's obviously on pins and needles at this moment Steve Chassis. Bob pins and needles and uh, this is a tough one Steve's a tough guy to talk to right now in years past this time of the week second weekend of qualifying you had the feeling you had a shot but it feels bleak this year. Yeah the car uh, you know we didn't get the car out until Tuesday of this week. And then it blew up on uh, Thursday. Then it rained Friday. And the car is just, it's just totally unbalanced and we haven't had enough laps. We probably had a total of maybe 30 laps all month. The car just does not feel good. And I'm not about to try to knock the fence down because I've done that before. You can't carry these cars. If they're not right, they won't go around the corner. So rather than uh, take a chance on uh, hurting myself and destroying the equipment uh, just kind of facing the facts that the time has run out and I feel sorry for Barry Shookman from Castle Recycling and for Kent Baker and for Billy Bignotti and myself and everyone that works so hard on it but uh, you can't do two cars in less than two months and uh, it's a hard lesson to learn uh, I knew it already but I you know you relearn it every time because you think there's a glimmer of hope but um, this is what it ends up. It ends up into a uh, dejected uh, Sunday and uh, another whole year before you can make up for it. Well, the team car was John Paul Jr. who got it into the field. He was bumped. And I don't think people on the outside of motor racing realize, Steve, that for a racing driver missing the Indianapolis 500 when you think that your chances are good at getting in, that's almost like missing a whole year's payday, isn't it? Well, it is. It's it's the majority of a payday. I mean, it's it's at, at, at the least you'll you'll earn. 
just to qualify for this race as a driver. So it, uh, you know, all your all your plans have to get uh, reset, and all your all your uh, bills have to get spread out a little further, just so you can continue. But um, it certainly is not. Uh, it's not going to make me stop. That, I know that for a fact. It's just. When the car is right, I can get the job done. When the car is wrong, I'm too old and too smart to crash it. Well, Steve Chassis, Bob, and Chris does have other alternatives, and uh, he will be back in Indianapolis, as he will at all of his enterprises, come Monday morning. Steve Chassis obviously hurt that the car is not going to get him into the starting lineup. I think what he had to say, Bob, really stresses the importance of a crew chief and his ability to get a car right for the racetrack. We've talked on and off in our qualifying here about a driver's ability to prescribe remedies to correct the car's imbalance and ill handling characteristics and so forth. And here's an exact example of that. Here's a car got the same engine, the same chassis, and the same tires as a majority of the other cars here that are going substantially faster. But for some adjustments, it just doesn't want to stick in the corners. And the crew chief has to learn how to take care of problems like that and it's really a black art there's not too many men that thoroughly understand these machines and that's why there are engineers here and aerodynamicists and some of the old school people who do not have engineers and do not have aerodynamicists run into these kind of problems and there is Rich Vogler, who sits on the pit wall waiting for his car to clear technical inspection he will be our next driver that attempts to make the 73rd running of the Indianapolis 500. Coming up next here on ESPN in about 20 minutes time, Sports Center with Tim Brando and Tom Mees. They'll have all the details on the NBA lottery this afternoon and all the action from the NBA playoffs. So join Tim and Tom at 7 o'clock Eastern time in about 20 minutes. Let's go to Gary Lee, who's with Rich Vogler. Walking down through the tech line right now, Rich Vogler with his wife Emily walks up to Chief Steward Tom Benford. And we had that controversy yesterday when they said the yellow light came on during his second warm up lap. So once again, they're having this uh, conversation, and Tom is saying, once again, it's the second time by if you're going to take it. Rich, you've been out in a, basically a backup car for Kevin Kogan. How fast did you have it? I just ran 2.12 my warm-up lap, and uh, the time is running out, so we're going to go out and make a qualifying run and, and practice with the race car at the same time. What adjustments to the cockpit did you have to make? Kevin's a little taller than you are. Yeah, well, I didn't make any. That's uh, I, I'm floating around there a little bit, but we tightened up the seatbelts naturally to, to keep my me inside the race car. And I got to go out and make as many g-forces through the corners as I can and put this thing in the race. Now, if you have to slide down an extra six inches, can you see over the cowling? Oh yeah, we can see over cowling. <laughs> All right, Larry Newber standing by uh, at the north end of the pit area. He's got to refold his handkerchief. Well, A.J. Watson has been around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway just about as long as anybody who's here in 1989. A.J., the subject is this communication between driver and crew chief. It's tough, isn't it? Well, it really is, but the driver mainly talks to the driver right now. He talked to Poncho or uh, uh, Bentonhouse. We're talking about a situation when a driver makes an 11th-hour change here, right? Yeah, right. So they talked to the driver and see how the car was handling, and, uh, of course, uh, Carter told him he had just a slight push, so don't worry about it. Should be all right. Just stand on it. Referring to Tony Bentonhausen getting into Pancho Carter's backup car, but still, somewhere along the line, that driver, maybe on the 5th of May or maybe on the 20th of May, has to be able to figure out what the race car is doing and then attempt to explain that to the crew chief. Well, I realize that, but we haven't had time to do any of that. He just jumped in about four minutes ago, <laughs> so I... He's just going to have to take it like it is. So whatever Poncho and Tony can figure out between the two of them in, I guess, layman terms, that's what Tony's going to have to ride with. That's about all. And he went out and hot lapped, and he ran it uh, just about as fast as Carter did. So uh, he knows what the car is doing, or he had two laps in it. Well, it looks like as the track gets cooler, Bob, the 213 laps become more and more of a possibility. And that's what it looks like everybody is shooting for. We'll know in just a few moments if Rich Fogler is able to achieve that. You know, race drivers rarely believe what other race drivers tell them about a car. Years ago, I was working at a race in Syracuse, New York, and Ken Fowler was taking care of a car that Joey Chitwood was to drive, and it was Joey Chitwood's first drive on a mile track. Fowler, having been a former driver, Chitwood said, Ken, where do you shut off here? And Ken pointed down to the first furlong pole right down near the first corner. He said, there. So Joey went out and warmed up, and he came screaming down the straightaway and the throttle wide open past the 
start finish line down the corner everybody in the pits was looking and Joey somehow made it through the corner throwing dirt all over the fairgrounds and he came around and he coasted in and, and he went up to Fowler and he said man oh man he said is that where you shut off and Fowler said no I shut off at the start finish line but that's where I thought you'd shut off <laughs> driver communication with right. the team with the crew chief that AJ Watson was talking about just a few minutes ago it really is uh, quite a responsibility but here is one driver Teo Fabi and the Quaker State Porsche who has found a different way to communicate between driver and team members. Larry Newber explains. In the history of motor racing around the world, the Porsche team is one of the most successful. Yet their success in IndyCar racing since coming a couple of years ago has been very limited, but the dedication remains. They have assembled perhaps the super team of the 90s, hiring some of the most skilled technical people in all of racing. And they have one other new advantage, which no one else has. They believe it's an advantage, and the evidence supports that. An active telemetry system that sends information from the car, monitoring its performance anywhere on the track back to the pit area. An onboard computer placed in one of the side pods collects and transmits readings on 20 engine functions. A small cockpit antenna beams the information to a mast and eventually prints items out like oil and water temperature and pressure, RPMs, boost, and remaining fuel. The telemetry goes from car to pits only and does not make adjustments automatically developed by Bosch and Porsche, the system is a redesign of one used by the McLaren Hondas in Formula One last year. Total value of all the hardware, a modest 1000 but development cost, $1 million. Well, I think it's very fair, really. We've got it. They haven't. No, seriously, it is a huge advantage for a team. It's just another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. You can watch it, uh, the engine functions in real time, which is always, you know, very important when you're out here in the pit lane and trying to gain every little little piece of the, the puzzle. Biggest advantage? Well, long before the driver pits, the crew knows the car's exact condition. When the driver's concentrating totally on winning the race, you don't have to be cluttering his mind by asking him to look down at the dash and distract him from getting on with the race. So you can watch, and you can also get more information because you can watch just about every function on the engine uh, that you want to look at, and you can see it happening. Obviously, the big advantage here is uh, in monitoring the fuel usage. So uh, instead of traditionally just keep running until the light goes on, the idiot light goes on, then you come in if it's under green, we'll be able to say, okay, now we're ready for fuel. We don't have to risk the idiot light. And obviously, we will have that as a backup as well. Can this system become active, that is, automatically adjusting the engine during a race by remote control? Obviously, there is the potential to uh, to change some of the parameters of the engine, say the fuel mixture and things like that. Um, it, obviously, that will be the next step for, for the teams because now, having got the information, it's a shame not to use it and optimize the conditions. And if the rules stay the way they are, I'm sure that will come. And for driver tail Fabi, this must be the release of a tremendous burden of responsibility. Actually, I think it's worse for the driver because you, you can't lie anymore. You know, they know exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the Quaker State Porsche-powered car that will uh, be underneath Teo Fabi on race day. The green flag comes out, and Rich Vogler is on his qualification run. You know, Porsche is starting on IndyCar racing. Built enough parts for 26 engines for one car. 22 have been assembled, and the 1989 version of the engine is far different than the 1988 version. And engines in that of that category are worth about 100,000 a piece. So there's another 2.6 million for this Wow! Car. Look at this. The backstretch speed for Rich Vogler was 217. He may have enough to bump Johnny Rutherford from the field. He's about to come down and complete lap number one. An interesting story last year as he barely squeezed into the starting lineup. He qualified on the opening day, but the first bump from the field at 546 by Gordon Johncock, but then went back out on the track and bumped Gordy from the lineup at 6 o'clock. Let's see what Rich Vogler can do here this year. The first lap, not too bad. It is good enough to bump Rutherford from the lineup. It's 42.217 seconds and a speed of 213.
18.184. It's just barely enough, but it'll do it. If, if Rutherford is in line next, he'll get out, but I think there'll only be time for one more car before the 6 o'clock gun sounds after Vogler completes his qualifying run. The drama is being played out. Here's the completion of lap number two for Rich Vogler. He's in Kevin Kogan's backup car. They're showing him a 13 on the board. Let's see if it uh, is indeed. Yes, it is. It's faster than lap number one. 42.196 seconds. And lap number two for Rich Vogler is 213.290. It's good enough. Speed average. Johnny Rutherford's perspiring now, believe me. 217.140 on the backstretch. That's just about what he has been doing the last two laps. And at the north end, between turns three and four, it's 211.7. Out of corner number four, he comes. And taking the white flag, Rich Vogler has one more tour of the two-and-a-half-mile oval. Johnny Rutherford has to be sweating it. There's Emily, Rich's wife, looking on. The third lap is a little bit slower than lap number two, but it's faster than lap one, and it's still good enough. 42.204 seconds at the speed, 213.250, and there's the average, 213.2, good enough to bump Johnny Rutherford, and there he is. Well, that's going to do it for uh, Vogler if that car hangs together, so John has got to walk to the car now and think about getting back into the Indianapolis 500. Which is a great job, particularly in a car that he never saw until uh, half an hour ago. Here he comes down for the checkered flag, and Rich Vogler has bumped his way into the starting lineup for this year's 500-mile race. We'll wait to absolutely confirm that. Yes, he does. The fourth lap was still good enough. 42.208 seconds at a speed of 213.230. A very consistent run for Rich Vogler, and the four-lap average is 213.239 miles an hour. Tony Bettenhausen will be the next to try to bump his way into the starting lineup in Pancho Carter's backup car. And we'll be right back for that. ESPN Speed World's exclusive live coverage of Indianapolis 500 time trials has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. By Audi, conform to the road, not the rules. Audi, the alternate route. By Cooper Tools, the difference between work and workmanship. And by Olympus, makers of 35mm cameras and video. Bernard Jourdain is now on the bubble for the 500-mile race with a speed of 213.105. Johnny Rutherford has been bumped from the starting lineup, and now the tension and the excitement really begins to build because Tony Bettenhausen is on the racetrack and has already taken the green flag for his qualification attempt. Here's the completion of lap number one. He has not missed a field in the 500-mile race since 1980. 80. And the first lap time for Tony Bettenhausen is not good enough. 42.368 seconds at a speed of 212.424. For the moment, Bernard Jourdain is safe. Now, here's where the bumping procedure really comes into play because Bernard Jourdain qualified last weekend and right now is in the middle of row number seven. But again, the slowest car in the lineup, regardless of when it qualifies, will be bumped from the lineup. And there is Bernard Jourdain, who has come on to pit road to watch this qualification run by Tony Bettenhausen. The second lap is completed. The first lap was not good enough. The second lap is also not good enough. In fact, it's just a little bit slower than lap number one. It's 42.371 seconds and a speed of 212.409. And Tony isn't going to do it with this one, Chris. Now, if he would pull in now and give Rutherford more time out there, Bernard Jourdain is wondering, you'd like to see him slow down and take forever to get back to the pits before the next car can go out. It's getting closer and closer to 6 o'clock. 2.11 through the north end of the racetrack. Tony Bettenhausen, however, is staying on the throttle and will complete at least lap number three. Nope, the yellow flag is out, and now Tony Bettenhausen will come back into the garage area. There is Bernard Jourdain. We'll be back to...
to Rich Vogler in just a moment. The next out to qualify is going to be Michael Greenfield once again, but a happy Rich Vogler is in this year's starting lineup. has almost expired in Indianapolis, and it seems like every year we have a date at this hour to talk to Rapid Rich Fogler. You did it once again. Your mom said you do this on purpose so your grandma can watch on television. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad you got to watch me make this uh, fifth Indianapolis 500, Grandma. I, I really appreciate it. But I want to thank the Machinist Union because the other car, we had problems with it this afternoon, and, and uh, Andy Kanapensky said, come on, Vogler, we're going to put you in Kevin's uh, backup car. And I went in there and made one lap, and we put it in line. I made four laps and put myself in there. You said that was the first time you'd gone flat out for four laps? Well, flat out for four laps in that particular car. Uh, the, 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 we're gonna, now that I qualify that car for the race, we'll make it fit to me. It's uh, Kevin's a lot bigger than I am, a lot taller, so we need to move the pedals back and things like that, but it was good enough to make the race. Maybe your cockpit was just too cramped. I don't know what it was, but I'll tell you what, the, the Machinist Union and Andy Kenipensky have been so good to me that, that I, 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 just, I just love them. It's neat. Rich Vogler is back in the Indy 500. A very nervous Bernard Jourdain watches Michael Greenfield on his qualification run. The first lap isn't good enough. It's 210.748 miles an hour, time of 42.705 seconds. Now, the guy waiting at the line is Johnny Rutherford. The question is, will they call Michael Greenfield off this run and have him commit and allow Johnny Rutherford to go out. If he stays out there on the racetrack, they are giving him the yellow flag. Now, Johnny Rutherford is going to get an attempt to get back in the starting field. We're about a minute and a half or so away from the six o'clock gun. And now, one final question remains for qualifying for the Indianapolis 500. Will Johnny Rutherford put A.J. Foyt's backup car into the lineup? I, I think Greenfield deserves a sportsmanship award yes. for coming in so early like this rather than staying out there. It's a fine sportsman, and the crowd is louder at this moment than it's been all day long as Rutherford takes to the track. We've got drivers, we've got everybody standing along the yellow line there on Pit Road. I saw Derek Daly move out and give Johnny Rutherford the thumbs up saying, go out there and put her in the show. Now, there is the official with the gun, and he is watching his clock right now. You can see the arm hanging out in just a few moments. He will put that gun outside and sound the alarm saying that qualifying is over for this year's 500-mile race. Johnny Rutherford has had very few laps in this race car. However, he's got the job to do. We're going to see if he can do it. Back in 1984, here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Johnny Rutherford drove for A.J. Foyt. He started 30th and finished 22nd. He comes down and completes one warm-up lap. Now, remember, because he's on the racetrack, it doesn't make any difference now. Now, when that final gun goes off, he can complete this run. And there is the emotion of Betty Rutherford. She is just praying and hoping and shaking with emotion that her husband can get into the field. Meanwhile, here is another very nervous driver, rookie Bernard Jourdain, who knows that if Rutherford can go faster than 213.015, he will be out and Rutherford will be in. Rutherford will take the green flag, no question about it, just to see what the car will do. There it is. The green flag is out for Johnny Rutherford, a three-time winner of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Trying to get back in the field. Oh, and the engine is dying. It's going away. The warm-up lap was 217 miles an hour, and the engine goes away. There's the gun. That ends qualifying for this year's 500. Johnny Rutherford's engine lets go in turn number one as the green flag comes out. And the three-time winner will not be starting this year's race. But Bernard Jourdain is happy and celebrates with members of his crew. He is in on the other spectrum of the emotional chart is Betty Rutherford. For the highs and lows, sure, really dramatic. And A.J. Foyt's engines for qualifying are not the best. The gambit of emotion in the pit area at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the final day of time trials for the 73rd running 
of this year's 500-mile race. Bernard Jourdain makes it. With a speed of 213.015, he'll start the race from the middle of row number seven. And so the field average for the 33 cars is 216.588 miles an hour, six miles an hour faster than the previous record. Sports Center is coming up in just a few moments. Let's review the starting field for this year's race. In the front row will be Rick Mears, joined by Al Unser Sr., and on the outside of that front row will be Emerson Fittipaldi. They're all PC-18 chassis. They're all powered by Chevy engines. The second row, Jim Crawford, Mario Andretti, and Scott Brayton. Row number three will have Bobby Rahal, Al Unser Jr., and Raul Boisel in row number three for this year's race. In the fourth row will be A.J. Foyt, Randy Lewis, and John Andretti. In the fifth row, it's Teo Bobby, Gary Bettenhausen, and Ari Leyendijk. The sixth row, Terrell Palmross, Scott Proen, and Ludwig Heimrath, Jr. The seventh row, Didier Tays, Bernard Jourdain, who made it, and Michael Andretti. Row number eight, Tom Sneva, Gordon Johncock, and Derek Daly. The ninth row, it's John Jones, Danny Sullivan, and Kevin Cogan. Row 10, Rocky Moran, Dominic Dobson, and Billy Bukovic III. And in the 11th row, Davy Jones, Pancho Carter, and Rich Vogler. Next Sunday here on ESPN, we'll have the Mexican Grand Prix. They're the drivers that start first and last in this year's 500-mile race. Rick Mears on the pole, Rich Vogler in the 33rd position. Thank you for joining us. This is Bob Jenkins from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So long, everyone.